Hello everyone. This is a short mini lecture on paper writing and specifically are you writing argumentative or thesis driven essays. Um, hopefully most of the information that we cover in this short lecture will be things that you've already been exposed to uh, in either in your CSP seminars or in other writing cl intensive classes. But this is also to give you a sense of how I will be evaluating your argumentative essays and kind of what are the things that I'm going to be looking for. So starting off at the most basic level, what is an argument? And an argument, we can start by distinguishing between facts, opinions, and arguments. So on the one hand, we can think of a bunch of facts. Facts are things like this such and such is the case that Occidental College is located in Los Angeles. Uh, and then we can have opinions, which express some sort of subjective preference or belief. Uh, Los Angeles is the best city in California. So arguments are neither facts nor opinions. Instead, we should think of arguments as claims that are defended by reasons. But they are not established facts, um, but they have a kind of truth value, um, making them more than just subjective preferences or opinions. They're not just expressive like opinions are, uh, but you can make more meaningful statements about fact, uh, arguments being uh, true or false. Uh, arguments are things that provide explanations. They justify courses of actions. They evaluate something. And you want to think of your paper as always trying to persuade the audience that they should believe something. Now, uh, the philosopher Stephen Toulmin breaks down the logical structure of an argument into three parts. Uh, the claim, and this is what you're trying to persuade the reader to accept. What is the main idea that you're trying to convince me of? The support, what are the reason or reasons um, that justify that claim, uh, that, that give me reasons to accept the claim? This is the because part of a thesis statement. And then finally, the, the warrant. And the warrant is the analysis or the, that explains why the evidence that you've provided means that I should accept that the claim is true. Um, and, and we can think of the importance of warrants because you could say something like in this essay, I will argue uh, that we should, uh, I will, in this essay, I will argue in favor of Medicare for all. Um, because the Earth is the third planet of the solar system, the third planet from the sun. So I will argue in favor that we should establish a policy, Medicare for all, because the Earth is the third planet from the sun. That supporting reason is true, it's a factual piece of evidence, but it doesn't necessarily provide reasons in support of accepting the claim. So the warrant is ultimately that logical connective tissue that links the evidence that you're providing to re as reasons that we should accept the claim. So we can look at a couple of examples here. In this essay, I argue that the women's national soccer team deserves a pay raise because the men's national team makes more money. Um, so we can break this down into the claim and the, the support. Uh, the claim is that the women's national soccer team deserves a pay raise, and the reasoning is that the men's national team makes more money. Similarly, on the second example here, I will argue that the Constitution should be understood as a strategic document rather than a philosophical one, because the founders represented states with conflicting and irreconcilable political and economic interests. Right? This is the reasoning that means that we should understand how we should interpret the Constitution. So where are our warrants? And the warrants are often implicit in thesis, thesis statements, but they provide the evaluative criteria that ultimately explain why this piece of evidence supports my claim, why this reason means the claim is true, or what connects the support and the claim. So in this first one uh, example, we can the, the implicit warrant here is that gender equality is good, that, that men and women should receive equal pay for equal work. And in the second one, the warrant is this claim that a document with reconciling multiple interests is unlikely to be philosophically coherent. Again, the idea here is that the warrant is often implicit, but it's the analysis that explains why this evidence that you've provided means that I should accept your thesis statement as true. So Toulmin develops this out into a fuller model. So we have our claim support warrant kind of structure here, uh, and then our support is often we can break it down into specific reasons, right? We might have two, three, or four specific reasons that we believe that the um, argument that we're advancing is true. 
And then for each of those specific reasons, we're going to have specific pieces of evidence. They might be uh, data that we were analyzing. They might be evidence from texts or interviews. They might be uh, examples uh, from, the, from experience, right? That these are going to be specific pieces of evidence in support of those reasons. And we also, depending on the nature of the argument that you're giving, we might provide additional backing or supporting evidence for the warrant. You might have to explain why, for example, in this, um, you might need to explain this, this point down here, um, that a document with reconcile, uh, multiple competing interests is unlikely to be uh, philosophically coherent. You might need to provide more of an explanation for that idea. But ultimately, you can, and that would be the backing. And then we can develop this further out because a good argument is going to uh, anticipate and respond to counter arguments. Um, and not just pose the counter argument, but respond to it. And then finally, a claim might have the additional point of a qualifier. Uh, you might identify particular conditions in which your argument is true. That might not hold universally, but it holds in a particular set of cases. Uh, there might be important exceptions or limitations to your, to your claim that you want to flag for the reader. So the Tolman model ultimately translates to parts of the essay. In your introduction, you're going to establish your thesis statement. You're going to provide your claim, your support, and warrant. You're then going to have a, depending on your paper, you might have a clarification section where you define any key terms, qualify any claims. If there are any particular historical or, or, or political context that you need to establish to make clear what you're talking about, you would do this in this clarification section. And then the substantive part of the paper, the, are they going to be the main specific reasons where you're going to have section, a section on reason one and specific evidence for reason one, a section on reason two and specific evidence for reason two. And then also in the body of the paper, you will raise and respond to objections to your argument. And we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail in a second. Finally, in your conclusion, you're going to summarize the argument, make any qualifications, and summarize the implications of your argument. So let's get a little bit more specific about thesis statements. The thesis is ultimately a summary of the argument that you're going to defend. It establishes both the claim as well as the supporting reasons for your argument. It provides the goal and destination of the essay, and ultimately in your thesis statement, you're telling me what you need to accomplish in order to get an A. Um, the but you are telling me, like, I, I will convince you by the end of the, this essay that this is true. Uh, and if you do that, then you get an A. That's more or less how, the, how that works. And so your thesis is usually going to be structured something along the lines of, in this essay, I will argue X because Y. Um, and your thesis definitely should have both clauses. A thesis statement that just says, I will argue X isn't a thesis statement. It's just a claim. A thesis statement has to include the supporting reasons. You need to have that because part of your thesis statement. I encourage you to use the first person. I encourage you just to follow this in this essay, I will argue X because Y format, because it makes sure that you have all the parts. Um, but you can be more creative. It can be two multiple sentences. That's, that's all fine. Um, so if we look at some of these theses um, that are not theses, right? Uh, this essay discusses whether or not college is worth the cost. That provides a topic, not a thesis. There's no argument here. Killmonger was right is a opinion uh, or even a claim, but it doesn't have any supporting reasons. Plato distinguishes things that are, the things that are just from things that seem just, right? This is just a piece of evidence. Uh, this is a kind of descriptive claim, uh, a factual claim that, uh, from Plato's Republic. It doesn't advance a claim that is contestable. No one would disagree with this. No one can say this is wrong. This argue, essay argues that college athletics should be abolished because student loan debt is high. Here, it is not clear what the logical relationship between student loan debt and college athletics are. There is no clear warrant. Uh, and the more complex the argument is, the more explicit you need your warrant to be. So ultimately, if you do not have a thesis, you won't pass. You won't get a passing grade on your essays. The thesis is, is, one, is often the first thing that I look for and comment on in your essay. So make sure you have a thesis statement. I've included a link to this uh, Prezi presentation, which is a flowchart that helps you evaluate whether or not you have a strong thesis. Um, you can kind of work through this with your thesis statement to answer and answer those questions to figure out, like, do you have a compelling thesis statement? When, uh, when we are moving beyond your thesis to your specific reasons, that you can break down your supporting reason into a series of subclaims or specific reasons that you have to defend. And then each of these specific reasons should be a section of your essay that has specific pieces of evidence that supports that specific reason. 
Um, so you might have some sentences like this in your essay, that the first reason to prefer structural realist explanations of international conflict is in addition, or in addition to providing alternatives to uh, these fossil fuels for energy, offshore wind turbine pro will also provide substantial economic benefits. This is a, a transition where he's moving from one supported specific reason excuse me, to the next. Now, after you've established your case, you've put forward your specific reasons, you then want to think about counter arguments and rebuttals. Um, and so an, a counter argument is a plausible argument against your claim. It gives an alternative explanation, a counterexample, or a reason not to access, uh, accept your thesis. It might be a specific, uh, an objection to a specific piece of evidence that you've provided. It might be a challenge to a whole, a whole specific reason or the warrant of your argument. And the reason why you need to include counter arguments is because anticipating and responding to criticism strengthens the argument. It shows that you've thought through the issue at a deep level and you've kind of weighed competing, uh, competing arguments and conflicting arguments and decided that the argument that you're providing is the most compelling. Additionally, once you've responded to an objection, that ultimately provides an additional reason to support your thesis by showing that other explanations, other arguments are inadequate. And then finally, if there are no plausible objections to your argument, are you really making an argument? Because remember, an argument is something that someone can disagree with. It's not an established fact. So how are you going to do this? Um, you want to think of how an intelligent and reasonable person would disagree with your argument. Are there plausible alternative explanations that exist for this phenomena that you're trying to explain? Are there other proposals or courses of action that could be taken? Are there notable counterexamples uh, that, 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 that challenge the logic of your argument? And when you reply or rebut this objection, you need to, um, you want to be generous. You do not want to dismiss this out of hand and say, like, this is a ridiculous argument. And you don't want to set up a straw person argument where the uh, objection is not a reasonable and compelling argument. Instead, you want to demonstrate why the objection is flawed or doesn't disprove your thesis. It might involve a concession. You might say, like, even if this one counterexample is true, it, in most cases, my argument holds. And ultimately, in your reply, you're providing an additional reason to support your thesis. So warrants can be in different places depending on the nature of your argument and the, um, the, the, the specific structure of your essay. They might be in the clarification section where you identify certain evaluative or normative criteria. If you're writing a paper that's advancing a moral claim, here you might explain what you mean by most moral, uh, or you might define kind of like how you are interpreting morality. And, and that's going to clarify your warrant. It also could be in the main section where you articulate the conditions under which your argument is true or not. But it is important at some point to explain and analyze why the evidence that you are presenting proves that your thesis is true. Um, what, what is this, I mean, if you're providing a case study, what does this case tell us? Uh, how, why should I prefer your explanation over a different explanation? How should I make these moral judgments? Ultimately, then you come to the conclusion of your essay you're going to summarize the main argument, restate your thesis, um, and then identify some of the implications. Uh, so what? Why should anyone care about the argument that you've made? What are some of the reasons why your argument is important and should be read? But at the same time, you want to qualify your argument. You want to be humble. You probably didn't solve all of the world's problems in one six-page essay, especially on topics that people have written whole books about. So you want to note if there are limitations, exceptions, or qualifications to your argument to show that you've thought about, all of this is trying to show that you've thought deeply and seriously about the issue that you're discussing uh, and that you're not making unsubstantiated claims. Now, when you are approaching the essay, I suggest uh, the, the most important thing you can do is to take time before you actually start writing to really bring, think about and plan your essay. Um, so when you are pre-writing, Think of different potential answers to the prompt uh, and identify different reasons for each answer that you can make for the prompt. And then once you've already established that list, pick the strongest and most persuasive. And then from the other uh, answers that you've rejected, you have your counter argument ready to go. Then build an outline based on the Toulmin model essay structure. Then each part of the Toulmin model becomes a section. Uh, and then you put, can put in specific evidence with cit citations in your outline. And then you can rearrange these sections to ensure a logical flow. Now, when you're writing, um, well, most, the most important thing is the strength of your analysis and argument. I am also like evaluating your writing on style. So in terms of, you want to think about four kind of key things that I'm going to be looking for. The most important one is clarity. You want to avoid confusing sentence structures, overly complex sentences with multiple dependent clauses, 
in which you lose who the subject of the sentence is or what you're trying to say. You want to avoid using obscure language and abstract nouns when you can make it more concrete. You want to avoid um, nominalizations where you turn a verb into a noun. You want to make your verbs active and your nouns uh, concrete. And one way that you can help with clarity is to read your essay out loud. Often when you hear the sentences that you've written, you can tell more clearly uh, and upon, upon hearing them which sentences are confusing and hide the point that you're trying to make. Um, the other point is word economy. You should really go through your paper with a red pen or marker and cut out at least 25% of your first draft. Um, you want to avoid any filler words that aren't actually contributing evidence or analysis in support of your argument. Because those filler words is just, they're just, they're not helping your, your argument. They're not strengthening your argument. Um, you also want to think about cohesion and the structure of the argument. Does the each section flow logically into the next? Do you have transition phrases that guide the reader along from one step of the argument to another? Are there missing logical steps in the argument? Often because you it's your essay and your argument, you know where you're going to end up. Um, but you have to remember that I'm not in your head. Your reader isn't in your head and they need to kind of, you want to make sure you aren't skipping any important parts of the argument. Finally, in terms of tone and voice, it's important that you try to emulate academic prose. And I don't mean writing with a bunch of jargon and lack of clarity, uh, but approaching these issues that you're writing about uh, in a serious and kind of scholarly tone, not a conversational one, avoiding phrases like, sure, why not? Uh, or I imagine, or hey, or uh, so, um, and other kind of like more conversational language that you would use. And if you're going to use the passive voice, this kind of uh, the passive voice where instead of saying he threw the ball, you would say the ball was thrown by him. Um, you want to make sure that you're using the passive voice intentionally because the passive voice can hide action and hide doers of deeds. And so you want to make it more clear what is happening by using active verbs. Now, citations, having citing your work is a basic expectation of college level writing, that you need to have the author year and page number or some form of citation for every reference to an idea, fact, quote, data, or theory from somewhere else. It doesn't matter if it is not a direct quotation. Um, if you are referencing a specific idea, like, uh, for example, Plato in book five, Plato in book five uh, argues that the, of the Republic argues that only the best guardians should be allowed to breed with each other in order to produce the best guardian offspring. Even if you're not using a direct quote, that's a specific idea that should be referenced with a citation. Um, you must use a consistent and appropriate style guide. For this class, we're using the Chicago Manual of Style. Um, I, you can use either the author date parenthetical citations or the footnotes. I'm fine with either way. Uh, there's a link to the quick guide to the Chicago Manual of Style on, on the Moodle page. And when you don't cite things, that's technically plagiarism. Uh, it's failing to acknowledge the work of others and, represent, and falsely representing that work as your own. So it's always, it's better to oversight than to undersight. When in doubt, include a citation. Um, so using the Chicago Manual of Style, you want to include at least the author date and page number um, if you're using author date or the author and the short title and page number if you're using footnotes for every citation. Um, in terms of plagiarism, um, plagiarism is not only a violation of academic integrity, but it also is just, it's stealing. It's a form of intellectual theft. So uh, I've included this chart that on, um, on the middle page, and it kind of moves from all the different potential ways that you might be plagiarizing without really knowing. So plagiarism can go move all the way from half-heartedly getting a little bit sloppy and fail to note certain citations to straight up identity theft where you steal another's document and claim credit for it. Now, most people don't, uh, most people probably aren't doing anything beyond like here, right? Anything beyond a kind of missing certain citations or citing things out of context or uh, or the finding an article and more or less follow on the topic that you're writing about and more or less following the argument 
rewriting that article in your own words and advancing it as your own argument, even though you haven't quoted, even though you haven't stolen any of the actual words from that article. That's still a form of plagiarism. So it is important to think through, to, uh, the, the, to look through this chart, um, and also to make sure that you're rep accurately representing the nature of the work that you're submitting. So ultimately, writing is hard work. It's an art that requires practice. I always suggest that you start early and revise often. Sometimes it's helpful just to put your words on the page first and then take a red pen and, and destroy, tear it apart and put it back together. Um, that's often how I write. Uh, and th that helps you to determine what your argument actually is. Use your resources. Uh, I'll talk about this in a second. Come to office hours, meet, form writing groups with your with classmates, go to the writing center. Uh, one rule of thumb that I say is to write your introductions last and then use your first draft's conclusion as your final draft's introduction. Because oftentimes you think you know what your thesis statement and your argument is when you start to write and over the course of writing your paper, your argument shifts slightly. And so if you need to go back and rewrite that introduction to reflect the act, what your argument actually ends up. I've read many, many papers where the thesis says one thing, and by the time I get to the conclusion, the thesis has shifted slightly and the reasoning is different, which is totally fine. That's part of the writing process, but you need to go back and make sure that it's consistent throughout. Finally, don't get discouraged. Writing is hard work, um, and there's always, even the best writers always have room for improvement. Even the best writers, people who write for a living, get writer's block. They have trouble. Uh, so this is a difficult skill that requires practice, and don't give up. So in terms of your resources, come talk with me in office hours. Again, you can use the profstarter.youcanbook.me link on the Moodle page. You can also swap partners with a peer. Uh, that's one of the best ways to get advice, especially since you're both working on the same paper. Uh, and then finally, go to the Writing Center. They, uh, make an, you can follow, uh, there's a link to the Writing Center website on the Moodle page, and you can um, schedule a writing consultation with the writing advisors. They will help you develop your thesis and your writing even better uh, in a strong and compelling way. So that is it for this presentation. If you have any other questions about writing uh, about the specific paper, I'm happy to talk in more detail about any of this in office hours. If not, I will see you next class and take care.